Hi, everyone, and welcome to Assessing the Accuracy of Land Cover Classifications webinar. My name is Cindy Schmidt, and I and my colleague Amber McCullum will be your instructors for today. For this course, we will have two two-hour sessions each Tuesday on February 13th today and February 20th from 11 to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. We offer a repeat session in the evening from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern Time, but please only sign up for one session each week. Each session will consist of a lecture followed by a hands-on exercise. You can find all the course materials at the website listed here. This includes past recordings, the presentation materials, and the link to the homework. We will also have our presentation materials available in Spanish. If there are any questions, you can also email me or my colleague Amber McCollum at the email addresses listed here. We will have one homework assignment available after the second session next week. The homework will be submitted via Google Forms and the links will be listed on the course website. To receive credit for homework, you must submit all answers by March 6th. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend both live webinars and complete the homework assignment. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course. There are several prerequisites for this course. First, you should know and understand the fundamentals of remote sensing. You can watch our on-demand course listed above, which includes two one-hour recorded webinars that you can watch on your own time. Because accuracy assessment is a follow-on to land cover classification, you should have an understanding of land cover classification, which you can do by completing our advanced webinar listed here. Lastly, for the hands-on exercises, we will be using ArcGIS software. Normally, RSAT uses open source software such as QGIS whenever possible, but for this webinar, we determined that using ArcGIS provided the least complicated approach to teach accuracy assessment. You can do accuracy assessment using QGIS, and if you're interested, I suggest that you contact the very active online QGIS community. Lastly, you will need Microsoft Excel to complete the exercises both this week and next week. As I mentioned previously, you can access all the course materials on the RSET website. Each week, you will be able to find a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation in both English and Spanish, a link to view the recording of each webinar session, and links to the Google form for homework submission. Please note that in order to view the webinar recordings, you must register. This helps us keep track of who is viewing them. Once you register, you'll, you will automatically be taken to view the recording. So this is the course outline for this webinar series. This week, we will focus on accuracy assessment basics. And next week, we will include instruction on how to calculate an unbiased area estimate of your classes using the error matrix. Before we go on with the next slide, I was wondering if we could have a quick show of hands to let us know if you've done a land cover classification before, and if you have, what have you used it for? We'll wait a minute for you to type in your answers because we'd really like to know how you use these land cover classifications. And also, if you want to add something in there, if you've actually done an accuracy assessment before also, and your results from those accuracy assessments, that would be great as well. So the agenda this week includes defining accuracy assessment, discussing sample design and methodologies, identifying appropriate reference data, describing how to create an error matrix, interpreting the error matrix to determine class accuracy, and then we will start with a hands-on exercise. And then finally, we will conclude with a short Q&A session. So what is accuracy assessment? 
It's the process used to assess the accuracy of a land cover classification or a change detection map. It uses reference data that are assumed to be true. It's a very important part of the land cover classification process because in addition to giving you an overall assessment of accuracy, it allows you to determine the accuracy of individual classes. Accuracy assessment requires that you collect information about the land cover that is assumed to be true. Since you can't identify what every pixel of your classified land cover map is, you have to acquire information that is representative of the population. The population in this case is the number of classes in your land cover map, as well as the size of the classes. To do that, you must use a sampling strategy or design. The basic rules for sample design are that one, if you collected training data for a supervised classification, the data used for accuracy assessment must be independent of the training data. In other words, you can't use your training data as accuracy assessment reference points. This is really important. They must be completely different. Avoiding bias in the collection of your accuracy assessment data is key to this whole thing. That's why you must spend time developing a good sample design and make sure you aren't using training data already used in your classification. Number three, reference data must be collected for all of the classes in your land cover classification, even if some of those classes are less important than others, and even if they are very small classes. To develop a robust sample design, you have to consider the sample size and the sampling method. Starting with sample size, the number of samples or points must be sufficiently large enough to statistically represent all the classes with enough in each class. To determine how many samples or points you need to collect for each class, there are several different methods, including the binomial probability theory, which uses the expected percent accuracy and allowable error, and other methods, which use the proportion of area of each class. No matter what method you use, generally, at least 50 points per class is recommended. We will not be discussing the different methods to determine sample size in this webinar. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for more information, you can view our session four webinar from the Carbon Monitoring webinar series, or go to the Boston University BEODA site, B-E-E-O-D-A dot org, listed here. How you select the location of your points is also extremely important. There are several different types of sampling methods, including simple random sampling, stratified random sampling, and systematic sampling. Simple random sampling means that you place the points randomly across the landscape. The randomness reduces bias, but there's no certainty that you will have all your classes represented or enough points in each class. So this is not the preferred method for land cover classifications. On the far right is systematic sampling, where points are placed at equal intervals according to some pre-decided strategy. For example, the points may be spaced equally 100 meters apart or 50 meters apart. Using this method, you are likely to include every class, but you may not have enough points per class. So this generally is not the preferred method either. For land cover classifications, the stratified random sampling method is the preferred method. In this method, a minimum number of points are randomly placed in each category. The randomness reduces bias, and by placing points in each category or class, all land cover classes will be included. So what are the best sources of reference data? The preferred method is ground collected reference data because it is most likely representing the true land cover class. However, it's also the most expensive and time consuming. Other sources of reference data could be an existing map, existing inventory data, such as forest inventory data, 
or visual interpretation of air photos or high resolution satellite imagery. Whatever source you use, ideally the reference data should be acquired at or near the same time as the classified data. If you collect the reference data at a later date than your classified data, you may be collecting erroneous reference data if changes have occurred during that time in the region. The reference data that you collect will typically have geographic coordinates and a land cover label that matches your land cover map. In other words, you wouldn't want to have a reference point labeled grassland if there's no grassland in class in your land cover classification. You can then create a point or sometimes polygon file using GIS software like ArcGIS or QGIS. The first step in the accuracy assessment process is placing the reference points or polygons on the land cover map using the GIS software. You will then select the land cover map pixels that correspond to those points. That results in the table that gives you the land cover class, the associated reference point land cover label, and the number of pixels or frequency of each combination. In the picture on the left, you can see the reference points overlaid on a land cover image. In the table on the right, the land cover classes are represented by numbers. So for example, class one might be water, class two might be forest, class three might be grassland, and so on. The first column are the classes from the land cover map. The second column are the classes from the reference points, and the third column are the frequency of pixels in each combination of the two. So let's examine this table a bit further so we can create an error matrix. In this example, class one is hardwood, class two is conifer, and class three is other. When the land cover classification and the reference points are the same, that means the pixels are correctly classified. In this example, 24 pixels were correctly classified as hardwood, 30 were correctly classified as conifer, and 23 were correctly classified as other. The other pixels were incorrectly classified. 10 were classified as hardwood, but the reference data identified them as conifer. Five were classified as hardwood. Five were classified as conifer excuse me, but the reference data, I've identified them as other. And one pixel was classified as other, but the reference data identified it as hardwood. Now we can turn that information into an error matrix. This matrix compares the reference data, which is typically across the top, and the classified data, which is typically on the left-hand side. The diagonals in the error matrix are the pixels correctly classified according to the reference data. The column totals are the total number of reference pixels in each class. So there are 30 hardwood, 41 conifer, and 29 other reference pixels. The row totals are the total number of classified pixels in each class. So 38 pixels were classified as hardwood, 37 were classified as conifer, and 25 were classified as other. The off diagonal values represent the errors in the classification. For example, 10 pixels were classified as hardwood but identified as conifer in the reference data. Five pixels were classified as conifer but identified as hardwood in the reference data. It gets a little confusing, but if you can remember that the reference data is across the top and the classification data are on the side, then that helps you keep things um, a little bit straighter. The overall accuracy of the land cover classification can be calculated by summing the diagonals and then dividing by the total. In this example, the overall accuracy is 24 plus 30 plus 23 divided by 100, which is the total, 
which equals 0.77 or 77% accuracy. The individual class accuracy is the diagonal value for that class divided by the row or column total. In this example, the conifer accuracy is 30 divided by 37, which is 81%, or 30 divided by 41, which is 73%. So what does this mean, and which one do you choose? Classification errors occur when a classified pixel gets misclassified. Either it is included in the wrong class or it is not included in the correct class. These two types of errors are called errors of omission and errors of commission. Errors of omission occur when a pixel is left out of the class being evaluated. So for example, all of the pixels that are actually conifers as identified by the reference data, those that have been classified as hardwood are errors of omission. Errors of commission occur when a pixel is incorrectly included in the class being evaluated. So for example, of all the pixels that have been classified as hardwood in your land cover map, those that are actually conifers that have been identified by your reference data are errors of commission. You can also state those errors in terms of measures of accuracy. Users' accuracy measures errors of commission, while producers' accuracy measure, measures errors of omission. So let's go back to our error matrix and determine the different accuracies. The user's accuracy or errors of commission are the diagonal values divided by the row total. So in this example, the user's accuracy for conifer is 30 divided by 37, which is 81%. To interpret this, you can say that of the 37 pixels classified as conifers, 30 were identified as conifers in the reference data. Five hardwood and two other pixels were incorrectly included in the conifer classification. The producer's accuracy or errors of omission are the diagonal values divided by the column total. So in this example, the producer's accuracy for conifer is 30 divided by 41, which is 73%. To interpret this, you can say that of the 41 pixels that were referenced as conifer in your reference data, 30 were correctly classified as conifer, 10 were classified as hardwood, and one was classified as other. The user's and producer's accuracies give you a better indication of which classes have the greatest errors. Although the overall accuracy is 77%, you can see that the user's accuracy for hardwood is 63%, and the producer's accuracy for conifer is 73%, while all the other accuracies are higher. This means that in your classified map, you've overestimated the amount of hardwood pixels and under, underestimated the amount of conifer pixels. So really, there's probably a lot of confusion in this map between hardwood and conifer pixels. To conclude, I want to stress that determining the sampling methodology is not trivia, trivial. According to avoiding bias, by developing a random sampling strategy and using good reference data is important. Generally, 80% overall accuracy is considered good, so you can see the example I use with 77% accuracy is sort of borderline. However, it's important to understand that identifying error is much more complicated than just reporting the overall accuracy. It's really important to know which classes have the greatest error by calculating the user's and producer's accuracies. Next week, we're going to use the error matrix to calculate unbiased area estimates of each class.
Before I turn it over to Amber McCollum to lead you through the exercise, I want to test your memory on something that I said earlier. So what is the preferred sampling method for doing accuracy assessment? And you can type the answers into the Q&A box. I gave you three methods earlier, so if you can let me know what the preferred method is, we can test your memory. I'll give you a minute or so to type it into the box. So if you typed in stratified random sample, you were correct. And the reason we choose ra stratified random sample, it's stratified because you have land cover classes and you'll be able to put all your, point, uh, your points into each land cover class. <coughs> and it's random so you can reduce the bias in picking your points. Now, uh, Amber McCullum will lead you through our exercise for today. Thank you, Cindy. The next step we are going to take for this webinar is to go through step-by-step step the first exercise. So exercise one, accuracy assessment. Now, you can go ahead and follow along as you listen to me go through the steps, or you can do this on your own by going through the steps in the exercise one document. It's totally up to you whatever you feel comfortable with doing. For this exercise, we are going to be performing an accuracy assessment of a classified Landsat image. We're going to review the sampling strategy and talk a little bit about reference points. We're going to add reference points to a map and create an error matrix to assess the level of accuracy in the classification. Before you get started with this exercise, please make sure that you have ESRI ArcGIS version 10 or higher and um, a newer version of Microsoft Excel. You also need to make sure that you download the associated data. So you'll need the clipped and classified Landsat 8 image, and this is saved as landsatclassified.tiff, as well as the reference point shapefile. And these data can be found on the webinar website. So you want to make sure you have those downloaded before we begin. For this training, we are conducting accuracy assessment using ArcGIS software as well as Excel. Uh, while we have in the past used the freely available or open source software like QGIS, we determined that for this training, it would be the most straightforward way to show you the accuracy assessment using ArcGIS software. Um, we understand that some of you might not have that software freely available. Um, however, there are some tools and um, useful websites for using QGIS for accuracy assessment, and we have listed um, those in the training materials, um, and you can contact us for questions on where to find that information, but we won't be able to provide any kind of um, support for actually conducting accuracy assessment with the QGIS software. We will just be using ArcGIS software here. So there are some tools available for using accuracy assessment with QGIS. Um, the University of Maryland has created a tool set called Biota, um, which is a really nice go-to place to find information about QGIS. 
And also, some of you on the line here might be experts in the QGIS community. So if you have any examples of um, tools or resources for using QGIS for accuracy assessment, feel free to share them with the community on here today. So as we begin, we are just going to launch ArcMap as our first step. So I'm just going to click on this here and launch ArcMap. As that launches, I'll talk a little bit about what, the, what to expect for this exercise. So we are going to use a Landsat 8 image that we have already classified. Um, if you're interested in conducting a land cover classification, we have actually done that with a previous RSET webinar last year. So you can go to the RSET website and view that webinar to see how you w could create um, a classified um, map you're on your own. But for this training, we, had, we are just giving you the classified um, map ahead of time. We are also going to be giving you reference points um, in order to assess the accuracy of the map. So as Cindy mentioned in her lecture, accuracy assessments allow us to evaluate how closely the classified image is to reference data from a different data source of information. And ideally, we would like to obtain reference data or truth um, by visiting the locations on the ground. So you're out there in the field with your GPS taking point locations, and you are making note that this is a um, agricultural area, and you have that point right there. That's the ideal way to obtain reference points. You can also obtain reference points from aerial imagery or even high-resolution satellite imagery, so long as it's taken within a very close time window from your, um, that, your image that you're classifying. In this exercise, we've already provided the reference data. And these were, per, were generated using the stratified random sampling approach. And as Cindy mentioned in the lecture, this generates random points within sub-areas. So it takes into account the area for each class and has a number of points distributed proportionally depending on how large the area is. You can do this in ArcMap using um, a, a handy tool from NOAA's Biogeography branch, and it's a sampling design tool for ArcGIS. And there's more information provided in the exercise about this. OK, so let's go ahead and get started. So once you've opened ArcMap on your computer, just hit click Cancel, and we will start with a new untitled blank map. One really important feature to have when using ArcGIS, in order to do any kind of a remote sensing or spatial analysis, is you need to have this spatial analyst extension. So we just want to make sure that we have that extension checked and it activated before we run any of our analyses. So if we go up here to Customize and then to Extensions, we see here that we have the Spatial Analyst extension checked. So we're good to go. So we can go ahead and close that out. The next step we are going to do is add our classified Landsat image. So we go up here to the Add Data icon, and we'll navigate to our Exercise folder. So once you have saved your um, data in an accuracy assessment folder, it should look something like this. You'll have a Landsat TIFF and a reference point shapefile. First, let's just add the Landsat TIFF by clicking on it and then clicking on Add. So your color scheme might look a little different than this. Um, the colors are just generated randomly whenever you open them up in into ArcMap, but we're going to go ahead and change the names of our classes as well as the color scheme to uh, reflect what we would like to see. So in order to do this, in the table of contents, we will just right click on our image and then go to Properties. Now if you click up here on the Symbology tab, you 
will then see unique values, and you will see each of these uh, categories listed here. So what we've shown you here on the document for the exercise on page four, we have the land cover categories that we have already um, created in our classification. So we have water, agriculture, hardwood or light forest, conifer or dark forest, grass shrub, and bare ground. So we're just going to rename these labels to match those categories. So the first one is water. And again, you can reference the exercise on page four to see these. And then agriculture. Hardwood or light forest. Conifer or dark forest. Grass, shrub, and finally bare ground. Now you can change these colors by clicking on the color icon here. And you can change them to whatever conceptually makes sense to you. So by doing that, you can click on the You can click on the color here. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have to give it a second to come up. And then you can change the colors um, here. So I'm going to make my water dark blue. My agriculture, I'll change to orange. My light forest, I'll make a lighter green color. I will make this a dark green. Grass shrub, I'll make a sort of a brown color. And then bare ground, I'll make a tan. And again, you can change these to whatever colors um, fit in whichever colors you like. Then you can click Apply and OK. And now we can start to see some of these classes identified here in our classified Landsat image. So this is an image from Northern California taken on April 6, 2016. And so you can see that it is a pretty rural area. There's a lot of forest region. It looks like there's some agriculture here with a river um, running through this here. And then we have a lot of shrubland and some bare ground. Now, it's always a really good idea to save your arc map along the way as you're working on it. It's something I do very often um, as I've had my uh, information erased or my steps I've done um, not saved. So you just go up here, File, Save, and we are going to save this as Accuracy EX1. And we can just go ahead and save it within our Accuracy Assessment folder. You can save it within your exercise one folder, however you like to do it, um, just to be consistent. So we should have this MXD extension already listed. And one other tip while using ArcMap or other geospatial software, it's, it's a good idea not to have spaces in your name. So um, we often use these um, slash marks to avoid spaces. OK, so we'll just save our map there. So next, we will add our reference points. And ideally, as I said, it's great to have on the ground reference. So you really know that that is true. We are going to go ahead and add our reference points in in the same manner as the Landsat image, just by clicking on Add Data and clicking on Reference Points and Add. So then you should see a lot of points pop up on your map. Now we are going to identify the unique values within our reference points file. So if we just right click on it within the table of contents, we can then go to properties. Again, go 
to symbology. Under categories, then unique values. Under the value field here, we're going to select land cover. And then we're going to click on add all values. Now what you should see here are the same land cover categories that we have classified. So it's really important to um, match those up. So you want your reference data to have the same class distinctions as your um, land cover classified map. So that's, that looks good. So now we can click apply and OK. So you should see these classes listed here um, on the side as well. So the next step that we're going to do, um, and now we've moved on to page seven of the exercise for those of you that might be following along. Next what we're going to do is extract the pixel values to each reference point. So what we want to do is we want to identify um, where all of these points are located, what we've classified that in the image as. So we are going to use an ARC toolbox, this little red uh, toolbox icon shown here along the top. And you can also, if you'd like, if you prefer, you can use the search icon to find these tools. Uh, we'll go through it the long way um, to just to ensure that um, we're finding the right tool, but it's up to you if you're really familiar with ARC. You can take the shortcuts when you'd like. So we are going to use a spatial analyst tool, extraction, and then extract values to points. So when you see a little hammer icon that means it's a tool, you can double click on it. For the input features, we are going to select our reference points. For the input raster, that's going to be our Landsat classified. And now we're going to go ahead and save this output as values. And we're going to save this in our um, folder with our other data. You might see a security warning um, depending on the, the computer you're using. Here at NASA, we we often get that warning, just a heads up that we're saving stuff to our um, computer. Don't worry about it if you didn't get that. So now we're just going to go in here to our accuracy assessment folder and save this as values. And this will be a, a shape file. And the extension should add .shp if you don't add it yourself because it'll um, it'll save as a shape file, but. It's always a good idea to add the .shp. Now click on Save, and then click on OK. So you will see that when we conduct some of these processes, you might see a Earth icon here along the bottom. You might also see the um, name of the tool being kind of displayed along the bottom. And when the, the process is finished running, you'll see this little check mark. Um, if the process didn't work, you'll see an X. Um, and if that happens, you'll have to do some troubleshooting. So our process worked. And you may notice that we have a new file here called values. So now we're going to go ahead and open the attribute table of the values by, again, right clicking and then going to open attribute table. So now you can see here that we have a few different columns, and we have a values column and a raster value column. And what this actually is are the values are the reference categories, and the raster values are the categories that our Landsat image was classified as. So you'll see, just by kind of glancing at it, that mo most of the time those are the same. And, however, there are some places where they're different. And so that's where the error is occurring in your classified map. Um, however, the column names of values and raster value aren't very explanatory. So we're just going to 
create new columns with new names just to make sure that we're not confusing ourselves along the way. So in order to do that, we are going to click on the table of contents table options here. And then add field. The first one we're going to add, we're going to call it classified. And it's fine to be a short integer and then click OK. Once we've done that, the new column appears here. What we can then do is right click on that column and click on field calculator. You'll receive this warning that says you're about to um, edit this file. Um, and that's OK. We know that we're going to edit it. So click yes. Now, all we're doing here is moving the the values from the raster value field to this new column called classified. We're essentially just renaming it. Very simple. So classified is going to equal raster value. So we're just going to double click on raster value. It should show up here down below. And then we can click OK. Now you can see that all of the values in raster value are the same as in the classified column. So we're going to do the same thing for our reference data. We're just going to go up here and add another field, call it reference, click OK, right click on our reference column, go to field calculator, yes, it's OK that we're editing it. And you, you might see raster value down here, so we're going to make sure we delete that. And our reference column, we're just transferring the, the values from the values column, aptly named. And now we click OK. And now you can see that all of these are the same as our reference column. So now we're just going to go ahead and delete the values and the raster values column to avoid confusion. So we can just right click on each of those columns and then delete the field. It, it asks us, are we sure we want to delete it? Yes. And do the same thing for raster value. Delete field. Yes. OK. So now we are towards the end of page 9, if you're following along in the um, exercise document. So now that you have your two new columns of classified and reference, the last thing you want to do is really be sure that you sort your reference column. So this is going to be important when we um, do the error matrix later on. We want to make sure that our um, reference columns line up with our classified. So what we're going to do here is right click on our reference and then just click on sort ascending. So now you will see that the land cover type lines up with our classified image here. And this is going to be important when we then create the error matrix. So you can see what we first have water and then agriculture. And if you were to scroll down, you would see the other categories. So just double check that before we go ahead and save our values table. So now the next thing we're going to do is calculate the frequency. So we have all the values of the reference points and we want to isolate the frequency of those values in our classified image as well as our reference points. So then we can compare how well our classified map is doing in comparison to the reference. So we're going to go ahead and close this. And we're going to navigate to the Frequency tool in our toolbox. Again, you can use the shortcut if you'd like, but you can also do it the long way that I'm going to do here. So we want to use an Analysis tool, Statistics, and then double-click on Frequency. 
In the input table, we're going to select values. This will automatically load those columns from the attribute table that we were just looking at. For the output table, we'll navigate again to our folder for this exercise. And we're going to save this file as a frequency table. And this is a database file, DBF. Click Save. For the frequency fields, we are going to select classified and reference. We'll keep the summary fields unchecked. And now we'll click OK. So once the process is complete, you should see this frequency check here. And now you'll notice that we've added a frequency table to our table of contents in the map here. So if we right click on this and click on open, we can take a look at it. So this shows us, this table shows us how many pixels were correctly predicted in the Landsat image for each reference point. So if we were just to look this over, we could see that um, our reference class is one, so that's water, and we've classified that as one five times. So that's the frequency. So now we can start to get a handle of what's going on here. However, this is still a little difficult to read. So what we're going to do is input the frequency into a pivot table. So we're just going to shift around some of these to make a little bit more sense. So we're going to go ahead and close this here. And we are going to navigate to the pivot table tool. Again, we'll do it the long way. Go through data management tools, then table, and then double click here on pivot table. For the input table, we're going to select our frequency table. For the input fields, we're going to select classified. For the pivot field, we're going to select reference. And then for the value field, we're going to select frequency. And this will all make a little bit more sense once we start to look at our table. Now we're going to go ahead and call this table our error matrix. So again, navigate to our exercise one folder. Save this as error matrix. Dot DBF, click Save, and then click OK. So this process should run fairly quickly. And now you should see an error matrix table shown here, also in the table of contents. So now we're just going to right click on this again and click on Open and take a look at this here. So now you'll see a table with six land cover classes and six reference point columns. So it's starting to look a little bit more like that error matrix that Cindy spoke about. So we have our classes here um, and then the classified um, values. So we'll start to look at this a little bit more. The final thing that we're going to do within ArcMap is create a Excel file based on this table. So we're going to go ahead and close this table, and we're going to navigate now to the Table to Excel tool. So this is a conversion tool, Excel, and Table to Excel. For the input table, we're going to go ahead and select our error matrix. So that's the what we were just looking at. And then we're going to, again, navigate to our folder, our exercise one folder and call this error matrix and save it as an Excel file. That XLS. 
click Save, and then click OK. Now, once this process is done running, you'll see this Table to Excel checked, but you won't see any files added to our Table of Contents just because it created a new Excel file in our folder. It didn't really add anything to our map here. For the rest of this exercise, we're going to go ahead and use that file that we just created and do some of our calculations. So again, it's always a good check to save our map here before we close it out or, or, or um, X out of it if we want to take a look at any of this at a later date and do any analysis. So now we are on to part four, calculating error in Excel. And this is the top of page 13 for those of you that are following along in your exercise. So what we'll do here is just minimize our arc map. And then we're going to go ahead and open up our Excel document. So we can navigate here to our error matrix, or sorry, our accuracy assessment folder and open up our error matrix Excel file. You can also navigate to Excel and then open, do a file open and find your um, error matrix. So now this error matrix is showing you your reference data in columns and your classified data in rows. The classes are still labeled as numbers, so we'll need to rename them in the rows under the classified column, and also for each reference label to correspond to our land cover classes. So we're, we'll do that and we'll clean this up a bit. The first thing we'll do is delete this OID column because we don't need it. So if you just go in here and right click, we can click delete and just get rid of that column there. The next thing we'll do is input our same classes, one through six, that we had um, from our, our reference points and our image. So we want one is water. Again, following the same um, order as we had in our initial list. So then we have agriculture. And then we have hardwood or light forest. Conifer or dark forest. Grass, shrub, and bare ground. We can um, change the size of this column so that we can read all of our writing here. And now we're going to do the same thing for each of these reference columns here. So we have water, agriculture, hardwood, light forest, conifer, dark forest, and bare ground. Again, we can double click on these to make them a little bit bigger so we can see everything clearly. So now this is starting to look like the error matrix that we talked about previously. The first thing we're going to do is add a total reference points column at the end and sum the values across. So we'll add another column here, call it total reference points. And then we'll use the sum function. So those of you familiar with Excel are probably very familiar with these simple tools, these simple functions you can use. Um, whenever we do a 
calculation, we use the equal sign, <clears throat> and then we can use these um, very simple functions. So we're going to use equals and then sum. And what we're going to do is sum across this entire row for water. So we can click on B2 and drag it across and to G2 and select all of those. So what we're doing is summing all of these values. Then we can click Enter, and the equation worked for us there. There are a lot of uh, quick uh, shortcuts that you can use in Excel, uh, one of which being this nice little drag option. So if you want to apply that same equation of summing from um, your B column to your G column and apply it to the next row down, you can just hover over this in the bottom right corner to when you see the hashtag here, the hash symbol here, and drag it down. So we can go ahead and drag it down. So the next thing that we're going to do is add a total classified points row at the bottom of the classified column. So we'll just type this in here, total classified points. And then we are going to sum the values of each column here. So for the water category, we have five pixels that were classified as water. For the agriculture, we will have 12. So we see what we've classified them as, and then we can compare them to what the reference points tell us. So we're starting to build this error matrix. Again, we use the sum function, and we can just drag and select each of these. We want to apply the same equation to the agriculture column. And again, we can use this handy trick of dragging the equation across. So it applies to each of these columns, all the way to fair ground. The last thing we want to make sure that we do is so is find the sum of all of the total reference points. So that's going to be the same thing here. We can drag it over and we should have 200 reference points the sum of all of our rest reference points here. So now to calculate the error, we want to sum the pixel values that correctly matched with our reference points and then divide them by the total reference points. So underneath your table, we're going to skip a row to avoid confusion and call this, this row total correct reference points. Again, we can make this column a little bit bigger. So to calculate the total correct reference points, we are going to use the sum equation and hold down the control key and add all of the values that are diagonal. So here we are now um, moving on to the top of page 16 if you're working along with us in the exercise. So the total correct reference points are all of these diagonal diagonals along our error matrix. And this is what Cindy talked about in the, the lecture. So we'll see this here. We'll um, we'll first do this for water. 
and then we'll add in agriculture and then hardwood and conifer, grass shrub, and then bare ground. So what we're going to do here is use equals. And you can or cannot use the sum function. In the exercise, we had you use sum, but you actually don't need it because we're adding plus for each of the cells that we're adding together. It's totally up to you. So now we're going to select each of the diagonal. So here we have um, classified as water, and it's, a re and its reference point indicates that it's water. So B2 plus, we have classified as agriculture, and our reference is saying that it's agriculture. C3, hardwood, hardwood. So where these things are lining up is where we add them into the equation. Conifer, conifer. So these are all of the ones that we're getting right in our classified image. And make sure we put a plus between each of them. Grass, shrub, and then finally bare ground. So now, if we hit enter, we can see that we have 156 total correct reference points out of our 200 total reference points. So now we can calculate the um, overall accuracy of, of the map. Just for simplicity's sake, we're going to um, move the total, correct, the total true reference points down here. So we'll create another column called total true reference points. And this is just going to be our total reference points here. So it's going to equal H8. Again, we're just doing this to, to make everything clear and organized for, for you all. And maybe we'll make these bold just to make them stand out a bit. Again, this is kind of formatting, but it, it simplifies things a bit when we have it all, all laid out here. So now we're going to skip another row and create a row called percent accuracy. And here at the top of page 17 in the workbook, or in the exercise outline, we see that the percent accuracy is equal to the total correct reference points divided by the total true reference points multiplied by 100. So we're just going to add that equation in. So here, this cell will equal the total correct reference points divided by the total true reference points multiplied by 100. And the multiply symbol is this little um, star symbol here times 100. So your equation should, looks just like this, and then hit enter. So now you can see that our percent accuracy, our overall accuracy for the map is 78%. We're just going to go ahead and make this bold. And just for security's sake, we're going to go ahead and save our file here so we're not losing any of this work that we've done. Okay, so the final part of this exercise, we're going to assess errors of omission and commission. And as Cindy mentioned, errors of commission are identified as the user's accuracy, and errors of omission are the producer's accuracy. Errors of commission occur when a pixel is incorrectly included in a category being evaluated, while errors of omission occur when a pixel is left out of a category being evaluated. So we'll first start with the user's accuracy or the errors of commission. So this occurs when we've included a pixel into our category that's not within that category. Okay. So we're going to add a row down here called user's accuracy. 
And we'll go ahead and skip another row just to make it look nice. And then we're just going to copy each of these categories because we're going to do it for each land cover class. And we'll put them down here. Now what we're going to do is for the user's accuracy, this is found by dividing the diagonal number by the by the row total and multiplying by 100. So it's this diagonal where we got it correct divided by the, the total reference points for that category. Okay, so now we're just going to do start with water where it equals B3, B2, excuse me, divided by the total number of reference points multiplied by 100. So you can see here that we, the accuracy, the user's accuracy is a little over 83% for water. Now we can do the same thing for each of these categories. So again, it's the diagonal, so where we got it correct here, divided by the total reference points in that category, multiplied by 100. And we can do this for each category. So now for hardwood, and conifer, just making sure we're selecting the correct diagonal. For grass shrub, and finally for bare ground. Now, just for, again, for simplicity's sake, let's clean this up a bit. We can highlight this, format our cells to have one decimal point by using format cells, decimals two, okay. Um, we can clean this up a little bit also by merging this, these two cells to have the user's accuracy over this entire area, so if you highlight the the two, and then click on Merge and Center. We're just going to give it a nice gray shade and bold it to make it look like our nice little um, error matrix up above here. So now we can see the with each of these different categories, we have a different level of accuracy. So you can see, for example, the agriculture is has a lower accuracy than, say, water. And again, remember, these are errors of commission. So something's going on here where we're including a incorrect category into our agriculture category and seeing um, a little bit more error in this category. So now we are going to take a look at the producer's accuracy. So these are the errors of omission when we're not including them in the category when we should be. Okay, so we're going to do this in a similar manner. We're going to skip a, skip a row, call this producer's accuracy. Copy our same categories over. We can go ahead and merge these cells, make it bold, give it a nice header there. So now the producer's accuracy is found by dividing the diagonal number by the column total and multiplying by 100. 
So now here, we for water, we are going to use the diagonal divided by the column total, the total classified points, multiplied by 100. And we'll do this for each category. So again, equals the diagonal divided by the column total times 100. So again, what we have correct versus our total classified points multiplied by 100. And then finally, our bare ground And again, we can just clean this up by formatting, selecting, going to Format Cells, Number, and having two decimal places here. Now you can see that the producer's accuracy and the user's accuracy are a little different here. So here, we included all of the water pixels that, um, within that category. So none of the pixels that were referenced that are truly water were excluded from our water category here. So here you can see how accurate your classification is for each land cover class, and if the map has greater errors of commission or omission. So you can see generally, it looks like we have greater errors of commission instead of omission. So commission is users, omission is producers. Um, Generally, producers are higher, but not, that's not true for all of them, right? So we see some differences in agriculture. Um, the errors of omission are actually uh, greater for bare ground. Um, so we can start to make some of these analyses and really think about where we're seeing the most confusion in our land cover map, where we might want to obtain more sampling points for reference data, um, areas where maybe we want to take a look at the spectral properties of our different land cover classes that we um, categorized initially and make some changes to those. So this provides some really good insight into um, where we're seeing confusion and how we might want to modify our next land cover classification. So oftentimes this is an iterative process we want to make sure um, that we're evaluating the accuracy of our map before we start using the map. So this is really an important step to analyzing your land cover classification. Next week in our exercise two and in our lecture for, for next week, we will really focus on this idea of standard error and in our classification and think about the area over which we have each of these categories. So we may um, see some differences in our accuracy if we in include the area for each of these categories. For example, the water category um, might have a smaller amount of error area in our entire map, and therefore the error, we might want to account for that error um, a little bit less in comparison to some of the other land cover classes. And so that's going to be the focus of how we calculate standard error and how we include um, a non-biased estimate of error by evaluating the area um, in our, each of our land cover classes. So that will be for next week. 
our additional, um, we have some additional online resources at the end of this exercise. If you're interested in it, any of them, there's um, a nice overview of map accuracy assessment and area estimation from the Food and Agriculture Organization and some others um, listed here. So that concludes our exercise for session one. Don't forget to save your, um, save your Excel file and uh, we will see you next week. And I think we'll have some time for um, a question and answer session if some of you followed along but had some errors or some questions along the way. So thank you all. All right, everyone, so we have about another little over half an hour left in the session, um, mainly to answer questions that you might have. Um, if you have questions specifically about the exercise that Amber just went through, I do advise that you take more time and go through that exercise yourself um, to because it's fairly straightforward. Um, but if you do have any issues after you go through it yourself, please feel free to email us. And Amber and I will be online here for a while to answer your questions. And I'll try to So we have a few people asking about the Kappa index. Um, we have actually chosen not to include the Kappa index in this particular webinar, and that's primarily because um, there's a lot of evidence in the literature right now that the Kappa index is not a very useful index to use. I know it traditionally was used in the past for accuracy assessment um, after the producers users and overall accuracy was done, then um, a, a lots of times people would use the Kappa index um, to give you sort of a another good measurement of accuracy. But there have been some recent um, papers out there in the literature saying that that particular index is not very useful. So we chose not to include the Kappa index um, in our webinar. I think next week when we do the estimated um, unbiased area estimation, that will be much more useful to you. We've had a lot of questions about uh, classification. And as we said at the beginning of this webinar series, this webinar is focused on accuracy assessment, not classification. We actually did a webinar series about a year ago focused on land cover classification. So we're not, we don't really have the time uh, to answer questions about classification in this particular webinar series. However, if you do have questions um, that you would like answered, I would advise first that you look at the webinar that we did a year ago on land cover classification. And then if you still have questions, that you email us and we'll be able to hopefully help you out or at least um, give you some information that might be able to help you out. So there's a question about how to minimize the error of commission. Actually, trying to minimize any of your errors at this point. What the accuracy assessment does is it gives you a good idea of where you have confusion between your classes. So you may have confusion between different vegetation land cover types and so forth. Um, and at that point, what you need to decide is whether you accept those errors or whether you go back and redo your land cover classification 
understanding where those errors are. So you might bring in additional information that will help you with that land cover classification, for example. Um, and one example might be that you are having confusion or errors of commission in, in vegetation, areas that have vegetation, but maybe they incur, occur on different elevations. So you might be able to bring in an elevation data set that helps you sort of separate out different vegetation types depending on where it is in that elevation spectrum. So there's many ways you can go back and improve your land cover classification based on the results that you get from your accuracy assessment. Here's a question. Is it appropriate to use Google Earth imagery as a reference for accuracy ass assessment? The answer is yes. Um, there are some really good resources out there for uh, the best ways to do that. Um, honestly, any kind of imagery that is a higher spatial resolution than the land cover classification will give you better information than not having anything at all. Um, we'll get you some information on resources on the best way to use the Google Earth imagery. Yeah, there's uh, several questions here about Kappa again, and there, there's one paper in particular, and I'll need to reference it, but it's called Death to Kappa. Um, and that's the one that's been most widely published and used, and then there's been some follow-up papers uh, after that about um, how CAPA is not being used in the literature for accuracy assessment these days. Um, again, I'll try to get the reference for that paper, and uh, we can post it. There's a question earlier on, question two, um, where it says typically scientific method dictates, dictates 20 plus one samples. Why is it so much higher for error estimates? So I'm not, I don't quite understand where the scientific method dictates 20 plus one samples. It, getting samples for doing accuracy assessment is really dependent on how many classes you have and understanding the statistics that go into creating a stratified random sample. And generally, the recommendation is to have at least 50 per class. I also noticed that a lot of people are giving great advice on how to use QGIS for this assignment, and I I highly encourage that you use QGIS. Um, we chose ArcGIS just because for us it was a little bit easier to put together this webinar. Um, however, I think if we were to repeat it again, we would try to use QGIS. So I recommend that any of the advice that people are giving you here online, um, if you're interested in using QGIS, um, that you should go for it and maybe you can send us um, the process that you use to get there and some of the issues that you've run into. Somebody asked if you can use Sentinel-2 data for accuracy assessment of, of land cover classifications derived from Landsat-8 data. The answer is yes. I mean, you can use, you can use anything that you think is um, of higher quality than your land cover classification data. The Sentinel-2 data um, don't necessarily have higher spatial resolution, um, so I'm not sure if the question is referring to using, doing visual interpretation of the Sentinel-2 data or to do a land cover map and use that for your accuracy assessment. That would probably be least preferred, but oftentimes in various locations, you don't have a choice, right? There is no other 
better reference data to use. So in some ways, you have to use what you can, even though your errors or what you define as true for your reference data may not be as precise as if you went on the ground and tried to collect that information. Yeah, so again, somebody asked, can you use the same imagery as the reference data? If you don't have anything else, manual interpretation essentially of your Landsat imagery or your Sentinel imagery, whatever it is that you're classifying, can you use that, do manual interpretation of that to use as your reference data? Yes, if you don't have anything else, then yes, you can use that if you feel fairly confident in your uh, interpretation of those data. Okay, I'm starting with question one, Elizabeth. I've noticed, uh, here's a question, I've noticed that changing projection of point samples from UTM to GCS, so um, geographic coordinate system, to be used with GPS device or Google Earth results in shifting in point locations. Yes, which in turn affects the accuracy of the collected reference data. How can we manage this? That's a really good question. Um, sometimes what people do is rather than collecting a single individual point, they'll, they'll collect points, say, uh, in a particular area. So if you know your pixel size is 30 meters by 30 meters, you might collect information in a larger area than that so you can compensate for any difference in those pixel locations. Okay, question six, I think Amber answered that. What was your reasoning to not simply rename the fields with the ultra, with the ultra field tool? I think uh, Amber answered that online, but I think she just wasn't aware of that particular tool. And I noticed later on that a lot of people were mentioning that tool, um, although there may be some limitations if you use that tool and then bring that information into Excel. So here, uh, question 11, Elizabeth. If you are working with 2015 images, is it okay to use 2016 reference data, assuming that is only close reference data available? So ideally, as I said before, you want to use reference data that's exactly the same time as your classification. Because if there, any changes have occurred during that time, in this case between 2015 and 2016, then your reference data is going to be different than your actual classification data. But if you think there hasn't been much change or you know where that change has occurred, then if that's the only reference data that you have, then you can go ahead and use it. There's a question here, land cover class provided with FluxNet data are often different from those of the IGBP land cover class. Is this indicator of bad accuracy of IGBP? So there's no way for me to answer that question at this point with the information that I have right now. Question, the next question, what spatial resolution um, raster pixel size do you suggest to use for a national scale in a land cover generation of seven classes based on remote sensing? So again, we aren't really focusing on land cover classification in this particular webinar. We did a land cover classification webinar about a year ago, and I suggest you take a look at that. I'm not an expert in national land scale land cover generation, so I, I'm not sure if I can answer that question. However, I know there are some global efforts going on um, mapping land cover at a national scale using Landsat 
spatial resolution imagery, so around 30 meters. Question, the next question, how can we explain the reason for low and high percentages for users and producers' accuracy? Well, those are errors. The, the low percentages are errors in your classification. And that's letting you know that you are, some of your classes are being confused with each other. So at that point, you need to either go back and take a look at your classification to see where those confusions are occurring and seeing if you can improve that classification, maybe bringing in some ancillary data like elevation or dividing your region up into bioregions or something like that. Are there any recommendations or rules of thumb on defining the optimal sample size with respect to the area of analysis and the number of classes? So as I said at the beginning, there actually are some fairly rigorous statistical processes that you can use to determine what your sample size is. Um, and we aren't going through that in our um, webinar this week. However, I know that in practice, a lot of people will say use a minimum of 50 points per class. That's just a ballpark. And it's also dependent on what you're using for your reference data. So for example, if, you, if you're doing field work to collect your reference data, it may be really difficult for you to get 50 points per class because of the limitations of going out in the field. And in addition to that, it's also very expensive. If you're using uh, aerial photography or high spatial resolution imagery, then you might be able to get at least 50 points per class. If you're doing an object-oriented classification, so that's using segmentation. How can I get the accuracy assessment? It's the same process. You, you get reference points, and you relate the reference points to your, uh, to your segments, essentially. It's exactly the same process. So there's a question, in these exercises of land cover classification, was supervised or unsupervised the area? So is the area different? Is the error different depending on whether you're using supervised or unsupervised classification? Every classification will be different, um, whether you're doing unsupervised or supervised. So there's no way for me to really answer that question. So there's a question, can we use this method for accuracy assessment with polygons as reference data instead of points? Yes, you can. You can use polygons instead of points uh, and collect sort of average information about the land cover class within a polygon. There's various ways you can do it. It's easier with the points, but then you run into the issue of accuracy of location of those points, as somebody had asked about that earlier. Somebody asks, in the case of this exercise, how did you choose the 30 meter cell size of your raster data set? We use Landsat imagery for this exercise as we do in most of our exercise, and the cell size of Landsat imagery is 30 meters. So we didn't choose it. It was, that is the characteristics of that data set. Again, there's another question about how many samples per class are enough for accuracy assessment. Um, and I'll, again, I'll say that you have to do a thorough statistical analysis to determine that. However, in practice, a lot of people give a ballpark of about 50 per class, but that's also dependent on what you are physically able to do, depending on whether you're going out in the field and collecting the data or you're using an existing data set. 
Somebody asked, what about working with pan sharpening of images? So I'm not sure um, what the question is exa exactly. If you're talking about, if you're asking a question about using pan sharpened images for your reference data, um, that will often work. It's similar to using any higher spatial resolution imagery where you're getting slightly better information than a non-pan sharpened image. So you could use a pan sharpened image for your reference data if you didn't have anything else. Somebody asked how to handle pixel shifting in the time series for classification. The first thing you should always do with imagery, if you're doing time series, um, if you're looking at a time series and looking at change detection or something, something like that, the first thing you should always do is overlay your imagery on top of each other to see if there's any pixel shifting. And if there is, you have to fix that right before you do any other kind of processing. Now, that, this answer is more addressing a change detection issue or a time series issue, not accuracy assessment. Here's a question. Can we produce reference data from NDVI calculation? That is probably not um, a preferable choice for reference data. It sort of depends on what you're comparing the reference data to. So if, you're, if you have an NDVI calculation and you're trying to identify a land cover classification, then that doesn't make much sense. Okay, here's another question. I have two Landsat ETM Plus images of my study area of my study area with hilly terrain for two different periods. The data resolution is 30 meters. How can I differentiate between current fallow ag land, pine forest, and scrub land? Again, this is we are not focusing on land cover classification for this particular webinar series. Although I can see that maybe what we need to do is another land cover classification webinar focused on distinguishing particular land cover types. For this webinar, we're really just focusing on the accuracy assessment portion um, of the land cover classification process. So differentiating between different land cover types is a really difficult question depending on where you are in the world um, and what the, what the spectral characteristics of those land cover types are. And that's, that answer is far more involved than what I can do in the next few minutes. So here's an interesting question. Any suggestions for improving accuracy when you have spectral mixing within a pixel? So I'm not exactly sure if I understand the question. So all pixels, if, if you're using Landsat or whatever, will have a combination of land covers within that pixel most of the time. So within, say, a 30-meter pixel, you may have more than one land cover class, but you may have a dominant class in that pixel. So depending on how you're collecting that accuracy information, you'll have to understand that if there's more than one land cover type within that pixel, you will choose the dominant type. That's one way of addressing that question. Can error be explained by the pixel size as well and proximity 
with the boundary between two different classes? Absolutely. There's error can be explained by a lot of different things. The pixel size certainly plays a part in that depending on the level of detail of your reference data. So if your reference data are really very detailed and you have a pixel size of 30 meter or more, there could be some error um, due to those discrepancies. Hi everyone, this is Amber. So we had a question earlier on um, pertaining specifically to the exercise about um, seeing some negative 9999 values in the um, raster value column when you ex extract the values to points. And um, this shouldn't be an issue if you use the files that we um, provided you with. So just making sure that um, you're using that Landsat TIFF as well as the reference data that we provided on the website. Um, usually a negative 9999 um, indicates that there's no uh, data, so it's a no value, essentially. Um, and given the files that we provided you with, they should line up and they should be fine and you should not receive the, the negative 9999. Um, so also, I would just recommend that at any point, if you are um, cr creating a table where you don't see any values or um, the file can't be opened in ArcMap, um, I would just recommend repeating that step again, um, going through very slowly in the um, exercise document. Um, because if you are using the um, Arc 10.0 or higher, all of those steps should, um, you should be able to follow along those without any issue. Um, so I always recommend just stepping through it again slowly and, and seeing if you have the same problem. And if you have the same problem over and over again, um, you know, one other thing I would suggest is saving your ARC map document and restarting ARC. Um, sometimes it can get a little weird depending on your computer. Um, if you keep running into the same issues. Um, another tip that I would also give you all is make sure you're saving the files to your computer. Um, sometimes if you're working in ArcMap um, and working off of a thumb drive, for example, um, there might be some issues with opening the data or um, saving it in the right place. So just a few tips um, along the way if you start to see some issues. Um, but if you keep having the same problem over and over again, you can also um, email us with those questions. All right, everyone. So it looks like we're winding down with the questions. So we're going to sign off for now. We thank everyone for joining us today for the accuracy assessment session. Um, if you have questions while you work through the exercise, please feel free to email us during the week. We'll be happy to answer your questions. Again, as a reminder, there's going to be a homework at the end of next week's session, not this week, but next week, and there's only one homework. So to get a certificate, you have to be on both live sessions and do the homework. Lastly, um, I hope you join us next week for the session where we focus on estimating um, area using some unbiased approaches. Um, I think this will be really useful and interesting for you. So thanks again for everybody uh, for joining us and we'll see you next week.